Um, so first, we're going to kind of start talking about like we're, we're just going to go quickly over like what has made the Boston startup ecosystem what it is today. I think like you know if you were to look at like probably the most obvious answer, you know, it's like MIT, Harvard, and all the other schools are here. Um, but to you guys, like, what have helped? Um, what helps make us what we are today? I'll take that. Yeah. yeah. So I think the first thing and the most important thing is exactly the university environment and the students. There are 150,000 students in the Boston area. Go 50 miles west, you've got another 30,000 in Worcester, Worcester Polytechnic. That is, that doesn't happen anywhere else. Not in Silicon Valley, not in Austin, nowhere else. The second thing I would say, and this is going back a ways, is Digital Com Equipment Corporation. Back in the 1980s, they ruled the computer industry, had 30,000 employees here. And there's one great thing about DEC, it collapsed. And when DEC fell apart in the 1990s, all these people were suddenly available to the industry. And I remember this because I was at Speechworks back in 1995, and we got all these resumes from people looking for jobs, and they wanted to join startups. They had become risk averse, didn't want to be in huge companies. And, that, and DEC also gave birth to a lot of people starting new companies. Uh, Kiki. Yeah, um, I'd love to add on to that. Um, you know, my background in Boston, I, I ran a technology and internet trade association called MyTex for 11 years. Um, and it was really a community building organization to bring everyone in the community together. Um, and that community part here in Boston and that connective tissue and the willingness to collaborate and meet and, and convene is really, really critical. Um, I left in 2010 to spend some time out in the Bay Area and then also in Austin and then just came back this past year. And so I now have a different lens of, of the community just seeing others. And I can't underscore enough like the collaborative spirit of Boston. It is so special. I think it's number uh, our number one, maybe not number one, but it's one of our top exports or imports, if you want to call it that. Um, and that is really what makes this place so super special and easy to access resources. So, so I'm going to kind of move us ahead just a little bit um, and kind of going off of that, what are Boston's strengths? Like, what, are, what have we been really good at in the past, you know, decade? And what could we get better at? And what are like the emerging opportunities? Does anyone, uh, Kevin, you want to start? Pick up. I think it's a good, ask, talk about the strengths, it's also a good way to talk about the ecosystem. So we talk about the education system, we talk about the support network in place. We've also had a very strong research environment between the university researchers, the quasi-research groups, the corporates, the, uh, definitely the medical research environment, and federal, so a very strong research environment. We've got a great environment for then commercializing research or interesting ideas between all the technology, uh, processing labs or technology transfer act opportunities. We are the second largest uh, uh, center for venture capital and angel money in the country. Uh, and we were number one up until recently, so California squeezed us out, but we're still very, very active in that, in that area. There's over 900 people, there's $50 billion of money locally, and most of it's in Cambridge and Boston, much more accessible than it used to be. I think the state and city uh, governments have been very uh, good about facilitating uh, infrastructure changes, convening people to start up new areas. There's the Massachusetts Clean Energy Council, Mass Robotics, which we got some state funding. Lab Central was a program to work with. Uh, Massachusetts Connect Technology Collaborative. And then the city of Boston and Cambridge have done some very creative things to make sure that startups have a place at the table. Uh, those are some things which are, are some of our strengths. Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more with uh, what everybody said up here already. And I think as you look to the future, um, this intersection of what is uh, some strong suits of Boston being, you know, life science and technology bro broadly defined, but even kind of, uh, you know, even more focused areas around machine learning, artificial intelligence. The intersection of those two is really going to usher in a completely different way how we all look at um, our own health, our own wellness, uh, how we look at quantifying physiology that we as humans have been unable to really harness, capture that information and say, what does this mean to me individually? The personalization of that data, whether it's be quantifying disease day or quantifying performance, that interconnectedness to all of this is a deeper understanding 
uh, this story that is human performance, that we all want to feel our best, whatever that means for, for us as individuals. And the, the deep capabilities being built out in that machine learning and artificial intelligence is a hub here in Boston. That, that's a massive strong suit. You need the technical talent to be able to do that. The, the over 150,000 students, the over 60 universities, that is a pipeline that is very difficult to recreate uh, around that. And it's, it, it'll be fascinating to see how, uh, where we're at, because we are really at the tip of the iceberg of a complete shift of how we think about our own bodies. I think it's a very valid point to point out that we're not also not a one industry uh, state. We have multiple sectors which are doing very well life sciences, machine learning, financial technology, robotics is very strong, enterprise software, and a very good strong consumer area also, which provides a lot of opportunities for fusion between these various sectors. And so, you know, I think kind of going off of that, you know, I think Boston, like one of its big strengths is that it's building a lot of technologies that businesses sell to each other but then, you know, there's this, this thing that people say is like Boston isn't really as good at consumer. That there might be some truth to that, but we obviously have some huge consumer companies here like iRobot, TripAdvisor, Wayfair, and then most recently CarGurus went public on Thursday. You know, they're an online car marketplace. And, uh, and so, like, is, is there a shift happening or, you know, are... Do we, should we just kind of stick to like what's our biggest strengths, which is kind of like that, you know, HubSpot, LogMeIn, PTC, like very like hard enterprise? I mean, I, I probably could uh, argue this a couple different ways, but um, part of me thinks that, you know, there's an organic nature of, of some of this and we in Boston have some amazingly strong industries that are leading in the country and in the world. Are we gonna lead everything? I mean, of course, yes, we do, we want to, but we might not. And so I, I think there's something around, we have some innate strengths that is, is really propelling this region forward. Will we lead in consumer? I just. I'm not sure I have a, a firm opinion on it, but you know, I, I think we're leading in so many others, and I guess I don't truly like try and dissect it that much. Right, That's yeah. one side of me, but maybe you all disagree. Uh, I think there's there's also kind of byproducts. They're natural, organic byproducts. I love how you said that for um, academic innovation and, and technology breakthroughs. Period, and it's like. In, in a lot of senses, you can use these breakthroughs in a lot of different applications. And the fact is, uh, Boston's getting better and better of saying, how is this relevant? Uh, not only kind of to the B2B kind of classic platforms, but how could this, this technology actually be relevant, and biotech be relevant uh, also to the consumer itself and tell that story in such a way. Um, but I think having the actual base to make those decisions, a platform to say, hey, there's actually high relevance for this use case doing this uh, is, is, is really, it's a different way to think about it. It's not necessarily always trying to build the next shiny object, which you could say that about other areas of this country, but the ability to create that platform and then work backwards of how could this actually fill a need uh, into our lives? And sometimes that's consumer, sometimes that's a B2B place, and that's somewhere else. You know, and something, um, Katie Stebbins, who is the former Undersecretary of Technology, Innovation, and Entrepreneurship, very long title, um, she traveled Massachusetts and in towns and talked to a lot of companies, and she said something really interesting, to kind of to your point, about how Massachusetts has so many different industries, and, and one of the best byproducts we have is those unintended collisions between multiple sectors that are coming together to create those byproducts. And, you know, I think there's something there that we could start to dig in a little bit more from a story perspective and others about where are those things actually coming together in those intersections. Um, it, but it's a really, it really got me thinking about how we're looking at Massachusetts in general. Right. And I, you know, I think like, you know, industrial, all, every, there's a lot of things happening in the industrial space right now, whether it's GE, which, you know, obviously moved its headquarters here last year or um, PTC, and then you got a lot of the um, companies in the design space, like Desktop Metal, um, Form Labs are 3D printers, but then you have Onshape, which is a cloud-based uh, computer-aided design company that's working with Magic Leap in Florida. 
Um, what are, I mean, what are some other, Kevin, did you have something or? Uh... Yeah, I just want to jump in on the consumer thing. Yeah. So we need to get past the mindset of it's not cool unless it's consumer facing. We just need to get past that, right? So for example, so my second startup, Tell Me Networks, we started out being doing this consumer facing like 1-800 number for you to call to get sports scores. And we actually got profitable, but there was no obvious revenue growth. Then we saw a B2B opportunity and, and uh, something that we just been, had been ignoring. That worked out, Microsoft bought the company for $770 million. I'm not unhappy about that, right? We should be excited about it. Just taught a class about Qualcomm, which is a company that people have kind of known about for a while, and now they're doing ads telling you that Qualcomm's in what's, what's in your cell phone. Like, this is the most insanely com profitable company on earth. They have 85% gross margins on their technology licensing business. So don't think that just because it's not an app on your phone or because your, your, uh, your uncle doesn't know about it that, well, I shouldn't do that. In fact, a lot of technologists, I worked at MIT for seven years, a lot of technologists, they, just, they want to be, and I see someone in a WPI sweatshirt, which is great. You're, you might want to be behind the scenes. Let somebody else deal with, you know, sales and warranty claims. You're going to invent the technology and then license it out like Qualcomm does. And that is a great business model. Kevin, did you want to add something? I, I think like that we've got so many strong industries around which yeah. are doing very, very well, which we're the envy of, the life science area, robotics, the clean energy area. I think we have a very good, strong um, contingent of, of consumer companies doing things on the web and some things on the devices, um, oftentimes which intersect with other areas like IoT and robotics. And I think we should focus upon where the strengths are and leveraging those industries. And consumer will grow over time. Um, and so we were, you were bringing up, Kiki, you were bringing up uh, Silicon Valley a, a little earlier. Um, you know, I think sometimes we get in our heads that it's kind of like a, a comparison thing where it's like, oh, you know, how are we doing in comparison to Silicon Valley? You know, they have Facebook and Twitter and Snap and, you know, it, it, should we be comparing ourselves and like, if there is a comparison to be made, what sets us apart? And I think I know the community part is part of what makes us strong here, but how, do, how should we be thinking about that? Like, so, um, Kevin, you'll remember this. Back in 08, 09, you know, everyone in the tech community was talking about, oh, we lost Facebook to Silicon Valley and, you know, that, you know, hitting ourselves in the back. And it was Alea Mary Menino and Governor Deval Patrick that really kind of brought everyone together to say, we're going to make this, you know, ecosystem, we're going to bring in more entrepreneurs, we're going to create this innovation ecosystem. And everyone banded together. And you know what's so funny is like right, I was so excited, and then I moved away. But the crazy thing is, is now I'm back seven years later, and so my view of Boston has completely catapulted. And it's just when you're not here every day, you don't you don't see it as much. But for me to be in two different cities and start to see some of the big companies that were having exits, having GE move in, having been named you know number one city for innovation. As the bystander outside, I was like, holy cow, like what's been going on in Boston? But I, when you're in it, you don't really think about it. So I, I think we need to be really, you know, take a step back and smell the roses a little bit. But to the same point, I, I mean, I'm so done with the comparison thing. and I think most people are. It's like we were talking before, like we are what we are. Boston's awesome for so many things, and so is Silicon Valley, so is Austin, so is Minneapolis, whatever it is. We all have our strengths, we all have our pros and cons, and the comparison thing, it's just like the compare an old boyfriend to, you know, a, a different boyfriend or girlfriend to a different girlfriend. It's like, you know what, we gotta like stop doing that stuff, it's just not helpful. Well, just quickly to, you know, on adding on Matt's point, like, I think maybe the reason why people think like, oh, we're, you know, we lost Facebook and we lost these other companies, but that's just because they're consumer facing. So you don't, it's so, it's easier to kind of see their impact, but we do have all these kinds of companies that are making a huge impact, but it's just not immediately apparent. And, you know, unless you're working for a big company that's using their software or their hardware, like that, that's where we are strong is that we're kind of powering kind of the future of business pretty much. Uh, and we should also recognize we're rec we are, are, are recognized around the world and continue to be a leader. We uh, entertain or bring through many, many different what I call innovation tour groups coming from countries, cities around the world and from the United States. And they're trying to learn what we've not learned over years to take back some things to their countries or states. 
And we're also opening up venture cafes around the world, and people very much appreciate it. And, and Mass Challenge has seen the same thing. They appreciate us taking some of our knowledge out to those other areas. And oftentimes they compare us to like New York and San Francisco, and we get high accolades for being a very mature, very aggressive, and being a very open community uh, compared to some other markets. So I think we should be comfortable with where we are, and we oftentimes look too much internally versus trying to take the big picture, look outside. And so I, I also think, uh, you know, kind of to follow on to that point, and I've just built a business around this, which is also playing to some of the strengths of Boston as well that have been yet untapped. And one of those things you could say are one of the massive strengths of Boston, period, are its sports. Uh, and the, the 35 plus championships that exist in this town uh, is a is a excellent standard for the rest of the world to look, look up to. And the passion of sports in this town is unparalleled across the board. Being able to intersect sports, technology, as well as kind of how that opens up big markets is exactly why I started the company that I started. And the ability to look and turn that passion uh, into the strengths of what is Boston around the, the technology powerhouse that it is, is, is something that, um, that is, was, is yet to be done. And, and by the way, you could, you could do that across industries. You know, that's one example, but it's a, it's a yet untapped where there's just a, a massive amount of upside. And the ability, again, and going back to how, I think there's a mindset here also that's different. You've been, you were in the barrier for a long time. I know you guys have spent a lot of time out there. It's a different mindset, which is, it feels like everybody's always has an idea. Everybody always is um, following something like a shiny object, shiny area. And this town is different and it's built a lot different where it's very thoughtful, very methodical and very thought out of coming to market and being just unbelievably intense around that ability to be able to do that. And I think it's, it's just a different mindset, not knocking anywhere else, but that, I love that about this town. I love the academic backbone of this town. I love how, how pensive and thoughtful everybody is uh, in general around here as well. And I think that's, that's an unbelievable strength and it's just, it is tough to recreate. I likened it to, um, remember California, 1848, the gold rush, and everyone moved out to California. That gold rush mentality has not left it to your exact point where it's just, they're looking, they're looking, they're looking and looking. And that's a great thing, but like that's how I kind of liken it. Like, wow, that mentality is still there. Um, so I think um, maybe a more practical question for me to ask, especially if people are kind of curious how to get more involved is like, you know, if you're doing your own startup, how do you find your own co-founder? How do you find kind of the support system you need to kind of get started? Because that also includes advisors, investors, mentors, potential customers. Like, how do you even get started with something like that? I'll take that. So I teach a class on co-founders. So let me talk about co-founders. The first thing you want to be careful is who not to found a company with. Be very careful about starting a company with a family member, also with a good friend, because that could ruin your relationship, and also with somebody who has the very same skills that you do. What you want to do is you want to look for complementary skills. So if you're an engineer, find a business person and vice versa. Second, make sure that you are that you have complementary networks. So if you went to the same school, you were in business school together, you're going to know all the same people. Look for people who know different people than you, because that's going to expand the reach of who you can recruit. And finally, you have to figure out whether you have the same values. And by values, I don't mean, you know, we love the, I mean, what, what do you want out of this? Do you want to be at this company for the next 30 years? Or do you want to do it for two years, sell it off, and go, go do something else? And there's not a right answer. It's not like one of those is better. But you want to get on the same, like two, two students in my class uh, started a company in educational technology. One of them really was a true believer, wanted to be in this sector for the rest of his life. And the other wanted to go to grad school in a few years. And they were doing great until they had an acquisition offer and they were trying to raise money. And one of them, and they got one guy wanted to quit and he was the CEO and they were not aligned on that. Same thing happened to FeedBurner, which had five founders. You wanna think super carefully about, is this the person I wanna spend the next five, seven, maybe 10 years with? And so don't just look for the people that you know right now. Like one thing I loved is last year, uh, in our business school, somebody was looking for a co-founder and they put up ads. They put ads all over the building saying, I need a co-founder. I'm technical, I want a business person. 
They're reaching out to people they don't know, and I love to see that, talking to people you don't know. Now, for people who are students, you know, they're either doing their undergrad or working on their masters or what have you, um, you know, should, should students who are just graduating, should they found a startup while they were still in school, or should they go to a, a bigger company first and then kind of eventually leave and start their company with that experience? Like, I, I, it happens both ways, right? Like, Mark Zuckerberg obviously started Facebook at Harvard, but, you know, you also have people who kind of, you know, join companies, kind of work their ranks, and then eventually, you know, spin out and do their own thing. So is there a right answer, or like, what is the right answer? Is there a right answer for a certain kind of person? Um, I'll, I'll do the perspective from Mass Challenge. So our program, we bring in 120 startups every year into the, the cohort. And, you know, I would say it really, it, it runs the gamut. You know, we get, we source a lot of our startup companies through universities. So we get a lot of our entrepreneurs coming in that have maybe are still in college. Um, that might be a little bit rare, but typically they've graduated from um, from college, they might be pursuing their MBA or something. I mean, we had, uh, in our class this year, we had a 12-year-old entrepreneur. So his mom came with him every time, you know, for the programming, so it was really cute. Um, but we've had as old as 84. And, and so I think it's when you have the idea and you see a problem that you're trying to solve and you have a solution and the time is right, you, you just do it. So that, that's, that's my lens from Mass Challenge. So. I agree. I think it depends upon the individual. If you have a great idea, you should just go do it. I don't think it has to be an either or. I also, that right now there's so many opportunities for people to do internships in high school and college, which gives you a bit of a sampling of the work environment. So you don't have to wait until you get out, get out of college to actually have a real job. You can actually get some experience about how companies work and organizational dynamics, which might help your idea come along while you're still in college. And we've seen some great ideas coming out, people out of high school and at college. So. I wouldn't tell them to stop and get a full-time job before you go do it. So if you got a great idea, you got a support system, get out there and start it. It's, it's okay to fail through the process. You'll learn through it. So I'm biased here because uh, I quit Harvard Business School to go to move across the country and do Tell Me Networks. And I helped start Glingo while I was doing my PhD. So I'm very biased on this. But I think college is a great time to look at a startup. Let's face it, unless your classes are super, super hard, you've got free time. And you could be hanging out and partying, or you could be like thinking about the, the next generation, what you want to do. And if it doesn't work out, it's not as if you're suddenly unemployed and you have to now look for a job. You're still in school. So it's a great time to experiment. Now, back to your question, what about joining a big company for experience? I actually think that's not the thing to do. If you want to start a company, you want to join a startup. Because this is a lower risk way to learn about what it's like to work without resources what it's like to work 90 hours a week and sleep at the office. It's how you learn how it's really like. And if you take a job at IBM, you're probably not going to have that same experience. So that would be my take. Yeah, and I, I love what you said uh, when you get out. I think when you're in college as well, um, you have this unique, and you don't realize it at the time, and I, I, I did various internships, but you have four years to do internships and dip your toe in, dip your toe out, dip your toe in, dip your toe out. And you have, you know, obviously entire summers left to absolutely explore. You can work with a big company, work with a small company. Uh, that's priceless. And you're really never gonna have that chance again to say, hey, I'm not sure if I like this. Um, you know, you're, you don't wanna get stuck in some job you feel like you're trapped in, et cetera. To be able to do that is, is very, very, very unique in uh, realizing that as a student, that's always the advice I get, is like, use this time to explore whatever you want because you're not really tied to anything as well. I, I do feel that though, regardless of anything, say you're getting out of school, as an entrepreneur, you feel so strongly about an idea. You've thought about it over and over and over and you've talked to tons of people and you get to a point <laughs> where you see the world so clear and it's crazy, the rest of the world does not see it how you see it and you are absolutely convinced around that, you gotta go, you gotta pull the trigger and go and do that and that's the type of person I invest in. And I get to know that person, I wanna know, like are they gonna run through every single wall because they absolutely believe in this idea no matter what and that's, that's what you look for. So I don't know when that time happens, maybe it comes when you're sick of your job at some big corporate, I don't know when that comes, but when it comes, tap it and go.
Um, Real quick follow-up. So one thing you might be worried about is, so what if I join this startup and it doesn't work out? Is that going to hurt me later in finding a, a job? And the answer is no. I just saw a study where someone did an experimental study where they put a bunch of fake startups in resumes, and it was just fake names you'd never heard of, you'd assume that it failed. And the question was, would employers be less likely to call those people for interviews? And the answer is no. There's no difference. It really doesn't. It, it's experimental. It's not a different judgment. So kind of going back to this, you know, where, where do you beat people? I'll do more, so something even more practical or, or locally based is, um, you know, I think one way for people to, for you to meet important people in your network and kind of get supporters for what you're doing is going to meetups. And there are just meetups every single week. Um, I would say uh, Mass Challenge has a uh, quite a few good meetups um, happening over the year. Um, and it's a good chance to kind of meet early stage startups. There's um, Mass Innovation Nights, uh, which also does kind of like a startup showcase. Um, but you know, even just like go to meetup.com and just type in startup or tech and there are just like so many groups that have like over 100 people going every time. Um, does anyone have a favorite like meetup that they go to or event? One of my favorites is Boston. No, I mean, great oh yeah, we have events Thank too. You. I got yeah. to plug you. So you know, it's not a meetup, but it's it's one of the best publications that started 08, 09, yeah. right around then, like right when everything was happening. So yeah. it hit the pulse right at the right time. So we not do answering have your question. Yeah. Great. We have an event on Tuesday. <laughs> uh, but does anyone else have a uh, favorite event? Well, I'll talk about what we've been doing. So Venture Cafe Foundation has been running a weekly meetup or gathering. We call it the gathering of the innovation community on Thursday nights uh, over the last seven and a half years. Uh, it's a combination of networking, but it also has people doing office hours, information tables, workshops, clinics, and seminars, all of which change each week. And we, get, we average close to 500 people coming through each week with a peak of being like 100, 860. So that's a great place for people to come in, to get an idea, talk to other startups, or talk to experienced executives to get some feedback on it. If you're looking for resources, ask for help, and people will give you some help, give you a point in some directions. Yeah, I would not say, um, well, the area that I'm thinking of is, I don't go to regularly um, on a you know regular cadence, but I think you know, as a as a as an approach where they have a variety of different menu items that you can go choose from. The Harvard Innovation Lab does an amazing job of bringing people in from every walk of life, from every single you know, from from intellectual property you know filing to how to start something from ground up to domain experts across every industry. Just fascinating to be able to hear stories, and I really think that's important for entrepreneurs to hear. Um, ground up stories of how people created a business or a business that fell apart or they fought against all odds, almost went bankrupt three times, or whatever it may be, that's an amazing story. And I think tapping into that in, you know, when I can find time to be able to go over there around being able to do that, they do an amazing job. Jody Goldstein, the managing director over there is just an amazing individual and she does an awesome job coordinating a team of just um, unique insights that are priceless really. And just, you know, a, a gem in our own backyard. I was also going to say, but use the digital tools. There are like the Ventures Venture Fizz, Greenhorn Connect, uh, our Star Hub calendars. So there's multiple calendars which have great resources uh, which can point you towards the right event or meetup to actually go to. And some of them are horizontal, some of them are vertical. So you can slice and dice your experience to get out there to find what you're looking for. Boston O has a it events roundup as well. Um, all right, I'm going to move on. Um, so we haven't really actually talked about like you know, what are the interesting companies that are here right now? Because I'm sure, you know, a, a lot of, most of you have probably heard of a lot of them, but, you know, I'll, I'll just start kind of like with what I think is very interesting right now. I think the maybe a more prominent one would be uh, New, Newtonomy. Uh, it's a autonomous vehicle startup. They uh, partnered with Lyft um, a few months ago, and they've been um, testing their self-driving cars in the seaport. And they've been working closely with the city and kind of trying to understand, um, you know, how does autonomous vehicles and how do you, um, shared autonomous vehicles like ride sharing impact uh, congestion and other issues um, that cities face. Um, I would also say um, there's uh, Desktop Metal, which is a metal 3D uh, printing startup that um, 
well, it's a it's a unicorn. It's worth over a billion dollars now, according to to investors. Um, you know, but GE is involved. Google Ventures is involved. Um, they're working with really big um, industrial customers. Um, does it, what, do you guys have any uh, favorite companies right now? So mine are pretty early stage. That's good. Um, but um, we just announced our top 26 of, of our 128. Um, we dwindle those down through the judging in the community to the top 26 startups in the cohort. And um, one I think is really cool, and it's, it's probably more near and dear to my heart, but it's called Cozykin. Um, it's actually over um, at um, Harvard iLab too, and it's really aiming to um, disrupt the childcare market. Um, you know, parents, and, and this is near and dear because I have a um, almost four-year-old, and I went through this same issue, and I wish I would have known about them. But basically, as a as a new parent, it is you know to to figure out where to put your child, childcare, daycare centers. There's long waiting lists, and so what they're doing is a not only a technology platform to actually bring together to identify parents or families, excuse me, in, in specific neighborhoods, get a nanny, and there's more of a nanny share situation. Um, they actually hire all the nannies as well, and so they're really trying to kind of blow up the child care center, mark, daycare center market, excuse me. So I, I think that's one of those ideas that has is really, really big potential and is really focused on a serious, serious, serious and not against all the other world serious problems, but a serious problem for parents. Oh, I agree. That's <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, there, I, there is, I, there's literally like a li list of 30 I could rattle off. Um, there's a company called Seven Cents Biosystems that um, is still fairly an early stage company, but uh, has developed a blood extraction, the ability to test your blood multiple times um, with a micro needle process. There's a company called MC10 in Lexington, which I spent a lot of time at. Um, which is really, really uh, has the intellectual property around ma elect making electronics thin and flexible, being able to gather accurate physiological data outside of a controlled setting. Uh, there's a company called Elysium, which is a, a kind of a nutraceutical uh, component with, uh, that's housed out of MIT, but the ability to make a, a coenzyme NAD plus uh, for metabolic and cellular health. Uh, absolutely amazing company. Uh, the, the list goes on at Whoop is a wearable heart rate variability uh, platform that just signed a really, really big deal uh, with the NFLPA and the One Team Collective uh, around being able to measure fatigue, readiness, sleep in a, in a highly accurate way. Um, they, just, they, they became the, uh, the first wearable to be approved by Major League Baseball. Yes, yeah, exactly. I think that's so cool. And yeah, they're about to make uh, even even more moves. You'll see some uh, some uh, some amazing uh, announcements coming out from there. But there's another company in a biotech space, Cocoon Biotech, another amazing company that was uh, spun out of Tufts research around silk protein, uh, using that. Uh, heating it up, denaturing the protein, and then using it as an injectable uh, to fight osteoarthritis. So being able to have the knee essentially glide uh, when that cartilage wears down. So um, you can, I, can, I can go on. There's another company, Super Pedestrian, which is an amazing company oh, yeah, at MIT, which is um, just a really engaged kind of e-bike play around uh, uh, making you uh, have superpowers. But I'll, I'll pause have you, there. Have you tried the Copenhagen wheel? What's that? Have you tried the Copenhagen? I, 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 I have. It's, it's amazing. amazing. <laughs> I, wrote, I wrote a review, bostino.com. Uh, anyways, so uh, Matt. So um, as an academic, I'm probably not as plugged in to the companies as most people here, but I'll mention one that I think is really interesting. There's a company called Electra Vehicles, not electric vehicles, but Electra Vehicles. And what they're doing is they're trying to solve the battery problem. And because when you want to do, put a battery in a car, you have to choose from two general types. One battery lasts a long, long time, but it doesn't have all that much voltage. So think of like a, like a Nissan Leaf. That car doesn't go that fast, but wow, it's got range. And on the other side is you got what Tesla uses, where these very high powered batteries that don't last forever. And so their, their question is, well, can we have a little bit of both? Because every now and then I want to go zero to 60 in two seconds, but not most of the time. So why am I always using a high voltage battery? Can't I have both of those in the car and just intelligently decide whether to tap the power battery when I need to really floor it versus using the long duration battery when I want to drive to see the leaves in New Hampshire? And so they're developing software and machine learning algorithms to detect which type of battery you want to use and then put both chemistries in the same battery pack, which really hasn't been done before. I'm really excited about what they're doing because 
Uh, range anxiety is the number one problem for electric vehicles, and I think they've got an innovations, innovative approach to solving that problem. Yeah, uh, likewise, I'm not going to spend, I'm not going to do a long list, but I'll highlight, and we talked a lot about tech startups. We are very good around Boston for doing non-tech startups. So I think there's some very exciting things happening in food startup, art, creative services, in some of the retail services, and some of those intersecting in areas which have not gotten as much support in the past, like aging and longevity and dementia. Uh, so I want to make sure we round out the, it's not all tech, but there's other areas right. which are doing very well. And we see a lot of this down in the Roxbury community in particular, some very creative things coming out of there. Um, just yeah. to follow up on that, yeah, yeah. there's another really good startup called PillPack. Oh, what yeah. they're doing is very low tech. What they're looking at, people like my dad, who's very sick, he takes about 15 medications every day. So he has 15 bottles on the counter that he has to open and pull out three times a day. And PillPack says, that's crazy. Give us your prescriptions, and what we'll do is we'll mail you these sheets of medications, and you just push them out, and we'll segment them by days of the week, times of the day, and it's not just saving costs, it's saving lives, because people are actually taking their medications, they're staying healthy, they're staying out of hospitals. PillPack is gonna be a global leader. All right, um, we don't have too much time left, so I guess like, what, are some misconceptions that people have about the startup world. You want to try um, questions from the audience? Yeah, actually, does anyone have any questions that they want to ask? All right, Here we go. you in the front. Got you got you. Hi, my question is for Kiki and Matthew, because Kiki, you deal with a lot of startups, and Matthew, your research tends to deal with the regulatory environment. So I work for a Fortune 500 company on the business development team, and one of the reasons that uh, we look at uh, business to business versus business to consumers is uh, there's a difference in regulatory environment, and there's a whole, it's a whole different landscape when even if you have a product that consumers might want to buy, it, the market uh, challenges and the perhaps barriers to entry are very different. Um, it would be great to hear you guys elaborate on um, perhaps the research that you've done and uh, how would you describe the market landscape for business-to-business uh, -business versus business-to-consumer in Boston, especially for startups. Let me see if I got your question. Is your question, um, how should business-to-business -business versus business-to-consumer companies think about the regulatory environment? It is. Okay. Thank you. This is the number one thing people don't understand about startups. You think about prototyping, you think about fundraising, you think about hiring, you think about strategy, but no one thinks about the regulatory environment. So, a couple thoughts on this. One is that, so as a bunch of companies have proven recently, one risky but potentially huge payout strategy is to find an industry that's very heavily regulated in ways that consumers hate, and you know what I'm talking about, right? Go do something that's actually slightly illegal, but very popular, and wait for the law to change. That's one way you can approach. But you have to be careful, because there was a startup called Haystack from my hometown of Baltimore that decided to basically sell parking spaces in, on public streets. And in Baltimore, it was wildly successful. And they said, well, let's go over this really bad parking, like Boston. They came up here, and the Boston City Council shut them down after a month, made them illegal. So you have to, and one of the problems is the founder was very hostile against the city council, went in there telling them how they should be doing things, didn't work things. Now here's an, an opposite example is Google. Now you might say Google has kind of a monopoly over the search market, right? The way that Microsoft had a monopoly on the desktop market in the 1990s, and Microsoft got killed by the Department of Justice, right? One of the big things Ballmer did was to kind of resuscitate the company. Somehow, Google has managed to steer virtually clear of antitrust sc scrutiny. Now, the EU is kind of on their case, but not the U.S. Department of Justice. How did they do that? I would suggest that that's the main contribution of Eric Schmidt, and that as a startup founder, you have to think very carefully about who could get in our way. Qualcomm's dealing with this right now, too. Taiwan just levied a $750 billion fine on them, nearly a trillion dollars, for, for monopoly pricing over their Snapdragon chips. So whether it's late in the game or early in the game, you want to think about who can get us in trouble, also who can help us, and how do we make the government and regulators a friend rather than an enemy? Great question. All right, anyone else have questions? 
Hi, my name is Leia, and I work for the State Department. I'm on leave right now to go to BU, actually. And my one of the things that we do internationally is we try and promote entrepreneurship as an American thing. And I've worked in other countries organizing entrepreneurship events. And everyone always asks, how do you get to have a Silicon Valley? What do you do to foster an entrepreneurship ecosystem? So my question is, what did Boston do to quote unquote catch up or, you know, how did those decisions get made and what, what are we doing to make entrepreneurship successful here and what lessons do we have for other cities, both domestically and internationally, who want to be leaders in entrepreneurship? Uh, I feel like entrepreneurship at its heart is this like push-pull of believing um, in yourself and your idea in that fighting almost head to head with your risk appetite uh, in some way. So I think uh, as you go across the world, and I've traveled a, a ton, um, the idea of accepting risk and that's okay is one of the biggest barriers, or not having that acceptance and not having that umbrella to say, hey, you're not gonna be perfect, not everybody's gonna be perfect. And um, when that environment happens, money flows. And when money flows, you have venture investments um, into riskier spaces, but that risk usually pays off with a greater reward around being able to do that. That environment um, is, is, is tough to create, but I think creating the first step, which is being able to say, hey, um, it's okay to take this risk, and if you fail, which you, you very well may, it's, that's gonna be okay as well. And um, if you go you know, to a country like Germany, uh, that's not readily accepted across the board, which is you know, different, obviously, and then you know, you're coming, coming here for around that. So it's, it's just a shift in mentality and, then, and just fighting that kind of, kind of risk appetite. I'm like, I'm okay taking this risk, and then money's gonna flow from that. All right, I think we're just about, uh, we have two minutes, so Kevin, do you want, do we have one more question? Um, can we do both of you uh, at the same time? Question. Uh, I'm Asila from Calipi City. Um, my question is actually because uh, Hubwick did such a great work by putting such a like, fantastic panel. We have several key stakeholders of the ecosystem, the startup ecosystem here already. So my question is basically kind of like, um, how do we really can build up a very like comprehensive the community for the startups in the Boston area? Because uh, I feel that actually we have all those different organizations, different like uh, like uh, venture cafe, like CIC, Mass Challenge, also Boston in law. But are we working together and uh, to, for example, building some Trello or some like kind of like platform to really help the startups, or are they just working like separately? And uh, will it be like feasible or practical to see that we can build a very complete ecosystem to help the startups? Thank you. Actually, can you not use the microphone? I think that's you just not use the microphone and ask that question. The echo makes it very difficult to hear the question. So <laughs> yeah. So the, the question is how we're, you know, we're all, we all have our own day jobs, um, you know, we're all kind of working in the same ecosystem, but how do we actually all work, do we work together, and kind of how? Um, so from the Mass Challenge perspective, um, we, the, the foundation of who we are is around working, trying to work with everyone, bringing all the stakeholders together, but simplest with, you know, 14 seconds left and some other people want to talk. Um, the most important thing is we feed, like, schools, we, we look to schools, we look to Matthew to help find startups to come to Mass Challenge. We look to Techstars where we feed to Techstars. Um, we look to Bostino to help promote what we're doing to get more word out about entrepreneurs. We might potentially feed one day from a sports tech, if you don't already know about it, but you, know, you might suggest go to Mass Challenge first, get the basics, and then come back. So we're like, we are a feeder 
um, to other things and feed from other sources. So. Yeah, and I would just quickly add, like, you know, for Bostino, we're always looking for interesting news to write about, but then that can feed into these people are going to, you know, these people we're writing about are be going to become panelists on our own events, and then it kind of just feeds into other things. So yeah, it's a great question, though. I think uh, I think right. that might be it for us. I think we're a little. Oh. I think we're a minute Going over. Now. It's a, yeah, it's a minute <laughs> over time. So um, we'll be okay. here for a few more minutes. But uh, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for coming out yeah, on a Saturday morning. I know. That's a that's a lot. That's a lot to do. So thank you.